All right. It's top of the hour here. So it's one o'clock uh, Eastern time where I am, just south of Boston. Um, I'm really excited about the about the webinar topic today. We're going to talk about um, science versus claims. You know, what can supplements do, the science part of it, and what can we talk about, the claims part of it? Because there's a really distinct difference between those two worlds that are really confusing to a lot of people. So we're going to we're going to talk about all that kind of stuff. So like always, um, Put your questions in the chat if you want to. Um, if you have a question, uh, raise it like you know electronically, virtually. Raise your hand if you're if you're joining here on Zoom. Um, we'll try to make this as interactive as possible. But I've got a ton of information to 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 got to try to go through over the over the next hour or so. Um, and what I'm going to do is share my screen and walk through just like what you would see with the documents that I've put into to the discussion section this morning. Okay, so um, before I get there. I want to sort of, I want to sort of like sort of, sort of frame this for you. So um, uh, where, where, where to start with this? Um, let me start with this. Let me start with these two books. So um, I obviously do a lot of research on dietary supplements. I do a lot of product development around dietary supplements. I do a lot of education around dietary supplements. So a few years ago, I wrote these two, these two textbooks. Um, I taught for five ish years at the university of Utah um, I taught a course at the at the University of Utah, what we call the U, um, specifically on dietary supplements. And the reason that I did that was because some of you may know this, some of you may not. Um, Utah is a a hotbed. It's like a, it's like a center for dietary supplements. You can drive up and down Interstate 15, which is the main main highway in in, in more main north south highway in, in Utah. And you can just point out all the dietary supplement companies. Some of them are manufacturers. Some of them are more sort of sales and marketing. Some of them are research companies. Um, there's 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 hundreds of them in the in the state. Um, in, in the state of Utah, dietary supplements are either second or third, depending on the year, in terms of the top industries in the in the in the state. So tourism is number one, skiing and hiking and mountain biking and all that kind of stuff. And then number two is either supplements or software. There's a lot of software development there now too. And so my idea when I moved there in 1999 was to say to the university, hey, you know, if you're training nutrition students, you know, to to learn about nutrition and then go out into the world and get a job in nutrition, if they stay in the state of Utah, it's very likely they're going to be working for one of these dietary supplement companies. And so they need to know <laughs> kind of what they're getting into, right? How to develop products, how to talk about them, how to do the research, all that kind of stuff. So I started a class there called Understanding Dietary Supplements, and it was partly about the research, but it was also part, partly about the product development process. It was partly about how you source ingredients, how, how, you, how you develop claims around these, the, these, these ingredients and these products. So it was, it was a pretty popular course. It, it, won, you know, it won a bunch of awards. It, it, it won me the, you know, the best instructor on campus you know, one, of the, one of the years that I was doing it. And I wrote two textbooks during, during that time. The first one was called the same thing as the, as the course was, a, a Guide to Understanding Dietary Supplements. And look how fat this is, you guys. There was a, I had a lot to say at that, at that point because there, were, there, wasn't a lot of, there weren't any books on this at the, at the time. So I had to write my own textbook. And what it does is it goes through all the, all the science on all these different kinds of supplements. You know? So there's a supplement, there's a section about, here's, here's the one about rhodiola. What is it? What are the claims? What's the theory? What's the scientific support? What are all the all the um, all the scientific uh, uh, papers that are written on that? So it goes through ingredient by ingredient by ingredient. But there's also a whole chapter in here about the regulatory landscape, and that's really what we're going to talk about most today. Then there was a so this is like sort of like a library version. That's why it's so thick. This the other version that we came out with was a. Um, was a uh, like a health professional's guide. So like a physician or a, a counselor or something like that could have this on their shelf in their in their clinic and they could use it as a as sort of a quick reference of like, you know, what is uh what is hydro hydrolyzed collagen protein do for somebody? What is uh what is uh, vitamin D do for somebody, right? And so it was different, different sort of, different sort of ways where we were sort of focusing the information. So I use those as textbooks in the class. And what I want to do now, I'm going to share my screen. Um, how do I do this? There we go. Share screen. I want to share. Oh, I just had it up. Now I've lost it. 
maybe I just, maybe I want to do this. I'll share Safari. That's what I'll do. Okay, you guys should be able to see this now. Yeah, this will work. So if we go here, can you guys now see, you'll see it in a second. You'll see, you'll see my, you'll see the discussion section from the canvas. You could, okay, I can see some people nodding their heads. Great. So what I put into the discussion section this morning is this post. It says August 4 webinar claims for supplements. So I'm just going to click on that and show you what I put in there for that. And it just says what, you know, what we're, what we're talking about today, how to talk about dietary supplements, science versus claims. This is an important topic. I'll talk about the differences and distinctions between things like, and this is important. This will kind of set up the rest of our discussion. And then I'm going to I'm going to share one of these files here uh, and walk walk you through the 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 regulatory landscape around supplements. So why is there a difference between talking about depression in different ways, right? There's the there's the disease depression which we should never talk about, right? We should never say to somebody that, oh, here's this here's this herb that can treat your major depressive disorder. Or, or even, you know, even saying to somebody, here's an exercise regimen, you know, getting outside and moving your body more um, is gonna treat your depression, right? We should never get into that language of treating diseases or curing diseases. And you'll see why in just a second. But there's a there's a lot of confusion around this. When people say depression, Almost 100% of the time, they're not talking about the disease, which, which actually is called major depressive disorder. That's the disease, MDD. When most people say depression, they're referring to a mood state that we all have at different levels on different days. You might be more or less depressed today than you will be tomorrow than you were yesterday, right? That isn't that isn't you diagnosing yourself with a disease if you say, yeah, I'm feeling a little bit depressed today. Same thing with anxiety. We Anxiety is a natural mood state that we have varying levels of. Some of it can be actually you know, really beneficial if we get a little anxious about a decision that's going to make us think more. It's going to make us like really focus in. It's going to it's going to motivate us. But it becomes closer and closer to a disease the more that it impacts our overall functioning on a, on a daily basis. So there's anxiety, the mood state that we should feel perfectly comfortable talking about, but we don't want to say that we're treating the disease, which is generalized anxiety disorder, which is something that is chronic and really causes a, a, a disruption of your life. We're going to talk about um, today, uh, uh, autism a little bit, right? In one of the products that I'm going to use, I have a whole show and tell over here. So I can talk about different ingredients and different products. We have examples of prebiotic fibers that can that we can feed to people with autism and it can show that we can change their behavior. They, be, they behave better for, for a variety of different reasons because we're giving prebiotics, because we're changing what the bacteria are doing, because those bacteria are sending different signals through the gut-brain axis, and those people are feeling better. So one of those main measurements is that they're feeling less irritable, meaning they're feeling more calm in a stressful situation, and therefore they can be you know, they can have better communication or they can have better, you know, social interactions and things like that. But we're not curing. And I, you notice I did that in quotes. If you can, if you can see me on the video, we're not curing autism spectrum disorder or ASD. Um, and then the last one I'll, I'll just mention as sort of a highlight, and we'll get into the, the details of this is ADHD. Um, there are good examples. And I think I blogged about this about a month ago. Um, there are really good examples. Um, uh, good studies are coming out showing that a lot of ADHD drugs like methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, um, or what are some of the other smart drugs that people use to um, to focus? Uh, Provigil, which is um, which is something that was originally um, originally approved to help people who have narcolepsy. Um, who like fall asleep all day. It's a very potent, it's a very potent um, stimulant to keep you awake. Sometimes people use Ritalin, sometimes people use Adderall, some people, sometimes people use Provigil as smart drugs to help their brains focus better. But they good studies are, are now showing that they actually don't do that at all. They actually interfere with your body's ability to solve problems. So they they actually do help you focus better. You're able to focus more intently. 
but that gets in the way of your ability to solve problems and be creative and things like that. So uh, if you haven't read some of those blogs that I've done, check out my blog and you can probably just type in ADHD or smart drug and you'll and you'll get the articles. But what we're trying to do here is say, well, wait a minute, maybe we can use a dietary supplement like a pine bark or a, or a theanine or a pomegranate extract or something like that to help with focus, which has nothing to do with a disease state like ADHD. Um, and that gets confusing, right? Because there's the gray area overlap of, well, wait a minute. If you have somebody who has ADHD and you improve their focus with a natural ingredient, why can't you talk about ADHD? And the reason is because of not because it's not true, but because of the legal regulations around how we're allowed to talk about supplements. And that's different than how drugs are allowed to communicate. And that's what these thats what these documents that you see here, these PDFs, that's what these go into. So what I've given you is I've given you um, a PDF version of two chapters from this Understanding Dietary Supplements textbook. Um, so chapter two was about the product development process. You know, so that will, that will show you... Um, you know, just where, where, how you source the ingredients, where they come from, what's the difference between an herbal extract and an herbal powder and an herbal concentrate, right? It's 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 that that sort of a discussion. It's not required reading. You're not going to be quizzed on it, anything like that. Um, but some of you might find it interesting. This other one, chapter three, is about evaluation of supplements. How do you evaluate the um the strength, if you will, of does this supplement work or not? And so we'll get into a little bit of that when I do the show and tell. Um, sometimes the research is going to be on a specific ingredient, um, and that ingredient might be in a in a product formulation. So you know, is it good or bad to base your claims on an ingredient that's in a product? when that's not the whole thing that's there? Or do you have to have claims that are based on the science around a whole finished finished product formula? We'll, 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 we'll discuss that in more detail as they get there. And then these two, these other two, these other two PDFs are the actual slide decks that I used to use in my class. So my class, Understanding Dietary Supplements, it started as just an undergraduate class for our nutrition students in the nutrition department. Then it morphed from being an undergraduate class to being a graduate class. And so once it became a graduate class, um, we got students from all over the all over the university coming. We got nursing students. We got medical students, which was really cool. We got business students because, like I said, some, the dietary supplement industry is such a big industry. There were business students that were going to you know, take their MBAs and go and work for a supplement company. So they wanted to know what the product development and the, and the science side looked like. Um, we got we got students from all over, which was which was really cool. And then it became an online class. And this was really early in the in the days of could you even do these kinds of classes online? Like you know, now we do now we do this. We do the we do the mental wellness certification. And it's just like, oh, everybody, everybody understands how to do it. But back in those days, it was a lot of people didn't even know how to open a browser, you know. So it was it was a lot, it was a lot of challenges to try to get that course off. But what I want to do is open up this one, this last one you can see here, which says supplement industry overview slides. So I'm going to click on that and it should open it right up. And there's a lot of information in here. What I've done with them is you see the slide information and then you see a little you see a little bit of verbiage on each page, right? So blah blah blah. I'm going to go down to page 17, I think is where where I want to start this discussion. Let me see. 15, 16, 17. Okay, cool. So all right, so there we are. Um, let me go up here real quick and move around my windows so I can see everybody. And before I jump into this, I'm going to go into the chat. It looks like there's a couple of comments in here. Um, yeah, so the, so, uh, we're not going to have these books available. Like these are, these are very dense books. Someone in the chat is asking, are these going to be available? You can go and buy them on Amazon, but, th um, they're expensive. Textbooks are artificially expensive for whatever reason like a regular book like this like my mental fitness book which you guys all have a digital copy of these kinds of books consumer books sell for like 20 bucks you know sometimes sometimes 24.95 these books you when, when you go find them they're going to be like a hundred dollars which is which is silly um 
unless you're a library, I would love every li library to buy this for a hundred dollars. That would be great. And every clinic in America to buy this for a hundred dollars. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say to go buy w one of these books, unless you really, really want to have a, have a textbook reference on your, on your shelf, but it's not, it's not for everybody. Um, and uh, someone's asked, where can I find the study regarding ADHD and Ritalin not helping focus? Go to my, go to my blog. Um, I wrote, I wrote a, uh, an article about that sometime over the last month and you'll pretty be pretty easily be able to find it with a link to the actual to the actual study okay uh, and i'll talk more about that when i when i talk about one of these focus products that i have that i have over here um uh, yeah it's right here okay cool okay so the whole supplement industry is governed by a law that was passed in 1994 that we refer to as DSHEA by the, by its acronym uh, by its acronym Deshae stands for Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. So this really changed the entire supplement industry from being just like, you know, something for hippies and something for weirdos that were using these herbs to treat their diseases. Um, now it sort of formalized this, this, this industry to say, wait a minute, it's not about treating diseases. It's about promoting health and about promoting well-being and that this established the first regulatory framework where it allowed us to say a lot more um, within within a, a very um, kind of tightly defined um, parameters, we could actually start to educate people. That's why it was called the Health and Education Act. We could start to educate people about what these what these herbs and nutrients and, and extracts could do. So Deshae really, really guides things. Um, and like all laws, right, you can go to the FDA's website, and you can download the, you know, the whole, the whole Deshae. But this is this is the this is the kernel of it that really really makes sense or really really makes the makes the law what it is. It was the first legal definition of a dietary supplement. So I'm just going to read this to you. Any product other than tobacco intended to supplement the diet that contains one or more of the following ingredients: a vitamin, mineral, herb, or other botanical, an amino acid, a concentrate, metabolite, constituent, extract, or combination of any of these ingredients can be called a dietary supplement. And that sounds like a lot, but what what this is what is cool is that it carves out things that are not dietary supplements. So a lot of uh, synthetic ingredients can't be dietary supplements. Pharmaceutical ingredients can't be dietary supplements. Um, uh, I don't have it on here. There's a there's another uh, um, a part of the definition that it has to be ingested. So things that you put on your skin, like a patch, can't be considered to be a dietary supplement. Even something that you would put in your mouth uh, so toothpaste can't be considered a dietary supplement. Um, a sublingual drop that you, a lot of people will take B12 supplements with a little dropper and they'll put them in their mouth and they'll hold it in their mouth and you'll, uh, you'll do the absorption sublingually, meaning under your tongue. That's technically not a dietary supplement because you have to ingest it. And so even if you're getting sublingual absorption, then if you swallow it, then it counts as a dietary supplement. So you have to ingest it. It's something that you have to eat. Um, and it cannot be represented as a conventional food. This is important. So there's a slide in here later, I think, where it talks about you can have one ingredient, let's say green tea, and you can have green tea in a skin cream and you can put it on your skin because it's so so there, there that, that's one example. You can have green tea in a supplement like a pill that you swallow. You can have green tea in a food like a tea bag and you and you make a tea out of that. Um, all those three are regulated differently. Cosmetics are regulated differently than supplements are regulated differently than uh, than foods. Um, and so there's a whole different set of claims for each one of those. But it's all the same. It's all the same ingredient. It's all the same green tea. So another aspect of regulation isn't just what it is, but how it's being used. So I couldn't make a chocolate cake and put an herb in it and call it a dietary supplement because it's represented as a cake. And so that's a food. So there's certain things that I can say about foods that are different from what I can say about supplements. People say all the time, they're like, couldn't you do a drink and talk about X? And if we 
if we say it's a food, there's certain things we can say. And if we say it's a supplement, there's certain things that we can say. And if, if it's a food, it'll have on it, uh, something called a nutrition facts panel. And if it's a supplement, it will have a supplement facts panel. And there's different regulations around that too. Reason I'm saying this to you is that you guys will maybe encounter as mental wellness coaches, you might encounter people saying, you know, oh, that stuff isn't, isn't, isn't FDA regulated, right? It is FDA regulated. It's very stringently FDA regulated, but it's regulated differently than foods. It's regulated differently than cosmetics. It's regulated differently than, than drugs. It's regu re regulated differently than medical devices. And so let me, let me talk about that a little bit. Let me see what this next slide says. Okay, I'll come back to that in a second about safety. So, well, no, let me let me let me put it up because this will this will lead us into what I was going to say. So, the FDA regulates um, four main categories of things for, for 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 our discussions. Five, really, if you if you consider the cosmetics, but we're not going to talk about cosmetics right now. Um, they regulate foods and supplements differently, but kind of like on one side of the FDA house. They regulate pharmaceuticals, drugs and medical devices on another side of the house. And the big difference between those two sides of the house are natural versus not natural. So, and the, and the big difference between that is a drug and a, and a medical device are new to the world inventions, right? Sometimes they're molecules that have never been seen before because they've been synthesized. And obviously they're devices that have never been seen before. They've been built or manufactured. The FDA takes the position that those are new to the world things that have to be pre-approved before they come to market. Supplements and foods, however, are natural. They've been around since the beginning of time and humans have been ingesting them in different combinations since the beginning of time. And so the FDA's position on that is they're natural formulas, right? Or natural recipes or natural conglomerations. And therefore we're gonna allow them to go to market and then we're going to monitor them. We're going to have a we're going to have an assumption of safety of those natural ingredients, and then we're going to monitor them over time to see if th there's there's any problem. So the burden of proof for unsafe supplements rests with the FDA. They're considered to be they're presumed innocent until they're proven guilty, so to speak. Okay, you can you could say it that way. So they're deemed to be unsafe or to be deemed unsafe by the FDA. They have, to prove, they have to prove this, and I have this in quotes because this is the language in the law. It presents a significant or unreasonable risk of illness or injury under the conditions of use. You notice I have, how I have that in red, recommended or suggested on the label. That means that if somebody starts using your supplement um, at 10 times the recommended dose and they have a problem with it, that's not really an unreasonable risk, right? If you're if you're saying this is the safe usage, this is the efficacious, effective usage, and somebody uses it at a much higher dose and has the problem, that's not your problem, right? As the as the supplement company, um, but if the FDA can can prove, hey, wait a minute, you know, we're seeing these reports, case reports, or you know, you know, in, individuals that are going on MedWatch and you know, complaining about side effects, those sorts of things. I've got a couple examples here: ephedra specifically Chinese ephedra, which back in the day was a huge weight loss supplement. Uh, it's it's no longer on the market because Chinese ephedra can actually increase blood pressure, not in everybody, um, but in, in a substantial enough population of people um, that it that it represented, you know, a, a sort of a dangerous supplement for for widespread usage. And so they took it off the market. Um, kava is something that was taken off the market for a period of time. It's a it's a relaxing kind of tranquilizing kind of an herb. Um, and it was taken off the market for a, for, for a little while. It's back on the market now because it was tranquilizing people too much. Um, and then there was something else called GHB, which is not really a supplement. It's really a synthetic that shouldn't have been marketed as a dietary supplement in the, in, in the first place. But it's, um, it's, it's sort of a specialized amino acid that is also used as a, as a relaxation, tranquilizing sort of a thing. But the, uh, safety is up to the FDA to show that there's a problem. And people sometimes get confused about that, right? That wait a minute, how can supplements go to market without FDA pre-approval? Well, it's because they're really regulated in all these other ways. Just that way that they're regulated is different from what, from what, um, from what pharmaceuticals are, are regulated. Here's uh, section five of Deshay talks about education. 
Um, this is this was the real game changer in 1994 that this allowed supplement companies to talk about their supplements as long as you talked about them in the right way. Uh, and so let me let me just go through here. So you can use third party publications, um, articles, chapters and books, other publications, if reprinted in their entirety, can be used to promote sales. So somebody, if they wanted to, could use one of my textbooks to promote their supplement but they would have to use it in in its entirety. You couldn't just go through and pull out some, you know, ch cherry pick some little one sentence that said something positive and then neglect the other part of the chapter that said, but blah, 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 right? So it, it, the, 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 the sort of guiding principle here is that it has to be, it has to be truthful. It cannot be false or misleading is the way that, is the way that, lawyers talk about it. Um, so it, it cannot be false or misleading. It may not promote a particular manufacturer or brand, which I have a big problem with. This is a glaring uh, omission in the law. And I'll, I'll explain why as I get into my show and tell. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say it like this right now. One of the reasons that you always want to look for branded ingredients, especially branded herbals, is because that's the one that has the research on it. Um, one of my pet peeves in this entire industry is that people will say, oh, look, that specific one has all this research on it, but I can go over here and I can get a cheaper generic version that may or may not be close enough, and I'll use that one. It doesn't work that way in, in your body. Um, what would be a good example? Well, here's a, I'm going to talk about a lychee fruit extract here. The brand that I use is one called Oligonol. Um, it's made by a Japanese pharmaceutical company. They're a natural pharmaceutical company, so that all the things that they make are, are natural ingredients. They just follow pharmaceutical practices at the level at, at their level of science. So the lychee that I like, lychee extract I like, is called oligonol. It's processed in a very specific way. Um, they have really good data on it for lowering blood sugar and improving um, improving blood flow and helping with weight loss and things like that. But it's it's expensive, right? They they have a lot of good quality in how they process it. They have a lot of good quality in how they study it. But I could go out and get a generic lychee extract for a tenth of the price, but that doesn't necessarily match up with the research because it's a little bit different in how it's processed, a little bit different in the research. Well, none of the research. And we see a lot of that sort of borrowed research across the industry. And the the, the problem with that, if you're the customer that has just bought this lychee extract, extract because you saw that it was going to control your blood sugar, and now it does nothing because it doesn't have the level of quality and potency and purity, then you're going to think, oh, I tried those lychees and they don't work, right? But you use the wrong one. So that's a, like, I wish that the law allowed more of specific promoting to say it's this specific one that was used in those trials and the you know the benefit of using that particular one you might spend a little more on it but you're actually going to get the you're actually going to get the benefits um it must be displayed with other literature um so if you have a supplement that is i'm going to say controversial um or at least um there's some studies that show that it works and there's some studies that show that it doesn't work you need to, by this law, you need to be able to put them all out there and then let the customer make their decision based on, oh, it's 50-50, or maybe it's 80-20 in favor. Maybe it's 80-20 against, right? So a good example of that is back when Dr. Oz was on TV and he was like at the height of his sort of popularity and things like that, one of the supplements that he promoted like crazy was something called green coffee bean extract. Another one, and I have I have some information about it in in these decks that I just shared with you, is something called hydroxy citric acid from from a plant called called Garcinia Garcinia cambogia. For a while in the industry, especially once ephedra went away, those two green coffee bean extract and Garcinia cambogia extract were like the darlings of the weight loss sector of of supplements. And a couple early studies showed that they work. But then other larger, more well-controlled studies came out and said, nope, 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 nope. And then, you know, we're at a point now where as a formulator, I would never use those ingredients because the, 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 the weight of the evidence shows, no, they're not very effective. And so, you know, a company that's selling those would maybe only say, 
well, let's just focus on these two studies that show that they work, and let's ignore those other dozen studies that show that they don't work. You're actually not allowed to do that by this law. The other piece is that it must be physically separate from the supplement. And this is where, think about this now, this was passed in 1994 when most supplements were, show, were sold on the shelf at a, at a supplement store, right? A GNC or a mom and shop, you know, herbal, herbal store, health food store, that kind of thing. Now, a lot of these sales go online, you know? So what is physically separate? And for a while, as the internet was developing, um, uh, people would say, well, is it one click away? Is it two clicks away? Like I couldn't have, I couldn't have this supplement, you know, on the, uh, you know, on one page and then all the information about the research on the same page. I definitely couldn't do that because that would be considered to be physically connected to each other. But if I said, here's the supplement that I'm selling and then click here for more information and you go to another page that has all the research, is that enough of a separation? And then for a while, there was this idea of, no, it has to be two clicks away. That would be physically separate. And that's just that's just kind of made up, you know, and different companies now have different ways that they handle it. Um, one thing that Amari does, and th th this is something that that changed when we started the company in 2017, we uh, started making for every supplement for every product that we had, we had a document called a technical data sheet. And so that would list all the research studies on all the different ingredients that were in the product. So let, let's let's go back to this one as an example. Here's Edge. This has the lychee fruit that I just talked about. We would have all the oligonol studies in one section of the technical data sheet. So somebody could click on the PDF and they could go, oh, look, here's 10 oligonol studies. This one's on obesity. This one's on diabetes. This one's on physical performance, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, great. And that was on the like the, that was basically on the on the front public facing part of the Amari website. But the problem with doing that, well, the good side is you're trying to give people information about why you use this particular ingredient. The downside of it is that some of those studies were in people with diabetes, some of those, which is a disease. Some of those studies were in people with obesity, which is a disease. When we talk about some of the mental wellness stuff, the prebiotics and probiotics and things like that, some of those studies were in people with depression, like actual major depressive disorder. And so the question was like, hmm, you know, is putting it on the front page, is that too close of a physical connection by this part of Deshay? And uh, is it too much disease language from the from the other part of Deshay where you can't talk about diseases? And so what was what was decided was we, we would put those technical data sheets in a part of the website that's only accessible to um to brand partners so it's not going out to everybody and there's there's pros and cons of there's pros and cons of doing that okay um so let me go down to this next section claims this is the big this is the big thing that gets everybody confused and this is mostly what we're going to talk about today which is you can't make disease claims with any dietary supplements even if it's the supplement works for that disease so this is this is probably the perfect example. This kids kids mood product. There you can see it there. Um, in this product is a very specific saffron extract. Um, it's a it's a brand called Afron. Uh, we we're, we're partners with a with a, a company that grows this this saffron in Spain. Most saffron in the world comes from comes from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Turkey, th th that that sort of part of the world. Um, this is a different kind of, of saffron. Uh, it's, a, it's grown differently. It's extracted differently. Saffron has lots of wonderful benefits. It's anti-inflammatory and does, does all kinds of wonderful things, antioxidant. This particular one really helps with neurotransmitter balance. Uh, so much so that the one that we use called Afron um, has been shown head to head in studies with Prozac to be equivalent to Prozac in teenagers with depression. It's been shown head to head with Ritalin, methylphenidate, to be equivalent to Ritalin in kids with ADHD. And yet we can't say anything about Afron or kids' mood with respect to those diseases, right? We can't say 
kids mood helps with ADHD. We can't say Afron helps with depression because of this section six of, of, of Deshay. You can't make disease claims. You can only make what are called structure function claims, um, which means instead of saying ADHD, I can say focus. Uh, instead of saying depression, I can say mood, right? And that that gets frustrating for people sometimes because you think that you're having to play around with words and you're having to do the song and dance about what's appropriate to say and what's not appropriate to say. It's also people get really bent out of shape saying like, well, it's my first amendment right to, to say what I want to say. Um, you know, and, and you can pull up the studies. I do this in some of the, some of the deep dive, um, uh, webinars that I do where like, if I'm doing one just about DH, or if I'm doing one just about ADHD, I might actually pull up those scientific studies and show, here's the title of the study. Here are the authors. Here's the journal it was published in. Here's what they looked at. They, they were treating ADHD with this particular ingredient because that's scientific information. I can talk about that all day long, but as soon as I then say, and then you can use this product. Now you have attached them and you're not allowed to do that. I know I can see people, I can see people on the videos shaking their heads and rolling their eyes. That's the that's the legal landscape that we that we live in. And so it's important for everybody to understand that landscape so that we can stay on the right side of the law and say, here's all this great information. How can we deliver it to people in a way that's legal and helpful and useful and, and doesn't get anybody into trouble? OK, so um, there are there are a few instances of what are approved uh, are what are called approved health claims. So there are a handful and this might be, I don't know, a dozen or so where for foods, you can make a claim that includes uh, some disease language. So if you have a if you have a food that is uh, low in fat you can make a claim around dietary fat and cancer. If you have a food that's high in omega-3s, you can make a claim around omega-3 fatty acids and heart disease. There's a lot of disclaimer language that goes with that. So a lot of food companies don't even want to use these claims because instead of making just that little claim, you have to use up this much of your label in order to say, and you know, blah, blah, blah. The science is not conclusive. Some studies show. It, it, it ends up being a lot of verbiage that a lot of companies don't don't want to do. Um, and somebody just put in, what about in Canada? Your your Deche, there are laws with Health Canada that are this, similar to what what our laws are with um, with FDA. They're very, 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 very analogous um, in Canada versus USA. They're very different in other in, in, in other countries, though. So whenever I go to another part of the world and I'm talking in. Turkey, or I'm talking in Europe, or I'm talking in Asia, it's a very, very different landscape. Um, what most of them share, though, is that you can't talk about diseases, you can't use supplements to treat diseases, right? So that's, a, that's a pretty consistent kind of thing around the world. Um, claim, staying on this on this discussion of claims, claims do not require FDA approval. What the language says is that manufacturers must have some substantiation that claims are truthful and not misleading. That's the actual language in the law. And so that right there is what opens this industry up to a lot of criticism and a lot of, right, I mean, rightly so criticism that, you know, company, like one company could say that some substantiation is one study in mice. And I'm going to make claims based on that. And another company might say, well, it's one study in humans. And another company might say it's two studies in humans. And uh, another company might say, we're not going to make any claims unless we have a, a, a study, not just on the ingredients in the product, but on the finished product, you know, the actual product that we're shipping to customers, right? And all, all of those are allowed with under, under, this, under this, this regulation. What does is, what is some mean? Um, you just can't, you can't outright lie, right? You can't make stuff up. That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty obvious, but this some language is what makes it, makes it a little bit confusing to people. All the products, all dietary supplement products have to have to have this. And this is what makes people think that the industry isn't regulated. 
uh, when it's very, very highly regulated, actually. They all have to have this, this uh, disclaimer that says this statement has not been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. That doesn't mean that the supplement hasn't been looked at by the Food and Drug Administration, right? It's looked at for safety. It's looked at for ongoing, you know, FDA looks for manufacturing standards. FDA makes manufacturers um, have a, a chain of custody uh, that's even more stringent than the pharmaceutical industry where you that you have to be able to know where did this ingredient come from, who had... Uh, um, who had possession of it over time? When it was, when it was received? When was it put into the product? So, like that that um, that chain of custody, so to speak, the sourcing chain is really, really heavily regulated. Um, but the statement, you can make up the statement. I could I can make up a statement for any of these products and throw it out there the next day. The FDA doesn't pre-approve that. Um, where the FDA really, really has most of its oversight is on this last part of it. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent a disease. And that's where we're always trying to like turn ourselves into in pretzels to try to give as much information as possible without stepping over that line where you're thinking where, where you're where you're where you're directly talking about a disease or you're implying that it can help with a disease. And that's where a lot of companies get into problems with what's called implied claims. So a good example is uh, glucosamine supplements um, or collagen supplements, which are really hot right now, right? Both of those can be used to help with joint discomfort. Both of those can be used to help you know, people move more flexibly and help with mobility and things like that. But if you, and I used to do, with, do this with my students, I would say, please go out and find me all the studies that show that glucosamine or collagen helps to improve joint health, okay? Go find me those studies. And they would come back the next week and they, 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 there are no studies, right? They would, be, they would be bewildered. Like, why couldn't we find any of those studies? We found dozens of studies that shows that glucosamine and collagen can help treat the pain of arthritis um, uh, or help to rebuild joint cartilage or help, you know, reduce stiffness or something like that. But none of them, show that it helps maintain joint health, right? That's the difference between what the data shows and what we're allowed to talk about. Um, so those are direct claims. What some companies would try to do is they would show maybe a picture of a, of a, of a knee and the knee would be all red. You know, The FDA would look at that and say, well, wait a minute, the redness on that image is an implied claim of arthritis and now you're saying your your product uh, improves joint health, but what you're really saying is that it reduces arthritis, right? So there's that. Like, what is your what is the whole sort of flavor of your marketing campaign look like? But you really just have to stay away from that around that disease language. Here's the last piece that I'll talk about, and then I'll go to the I'll go to the um to the show and tell so to, so to speak. There's a difference between how the FDA regulates supplements and how the FTC regulates supplements. Um, so FDA looks at claims on product labeling, packaging, inserts, promotional materials uh, are around the point of sale. FTC, Federal Trade Com Commission, is claims in advertising. Um, so infomercials, ads, catalogs, direct marketing on the internet. They have shared jurisdiction. So a lot of times, FDA might see something that is really an advertising problem, and they'll say, well, it's not really disease language, so we're going we're gonna to throw it over the wall to FTC and vice versa. Um, if, you, if you kind of follow the, the, if you follow the advice of truthful and, mis and not misleading, that's going to keep you out of trouble with the FTC. And if you follow the, the rule of don't talk about diseases, that's going to keep you out of trouble with the FDA. Some companies get in trouble on both sides, and some companies get in trouble on one side or the other. So if th think about it, this is sort of a simple, simplistic way to think about it, but it, it, it sort of is, is kind of the moral of the story. FDA is going to get you if you're talking about diseases. FTC is going to get you if you talk about things that you can't substantiate. Does that make sense to everybody? I, yeah, I think so. So those are the, those are the two places. Um, but what happens? If you have something that's true, so FTC isn't going to hassle you about it, but it happens to be 
in a disease situation. FDA doesn't like that, but it's true. So who who wins out? You know, the rule of thumb is to try to not do either of those. And that's where the, that's where the rest of this discussion is going to be. Yes. OK, so I'm going to stop my share. Let me see how I do this. Stop share. OK, now you're back to me, because what I want you to be able to see is some of these products. So this one. Um, I, and and I'm, I have a whole I have a whole bunch of products sitting here to the to the to my left. And I'm just going to go through them to give you some examples of what we're up against out there. Right. So I talked about this one already. Kids mood in here is that Afron specific version of saffron. So in that in the studies that I'm referring to, there's a study that shows that this specific saffron is equivalent to Ritalin for kids with ADHD. It's equivalent to Prozac for teenagers with depression. Um, it also helps postmenopausal women with insomnia. Right. Insomnia is also a disease. We can't say any of those things. Right. We, we can't say equivalent to Ritalin. Um, we can't say equivalent to Prozac. We can't say insomnia. So you have to say improve sleep quality for the menopausal group. You have to say improve mood for the teenager group. And you have to say improve mental focus for the for the kid group, right? That keeps you out of trouble with, with both of the regulatory organizations. FTC, because it's true and you can show them the papers. Um, and FDA, because you can't say diseases, so you have to go and you have to say what is the healthful side of that disease, if that if that makes sense. Okay, so that's so that's one example. We we actually at Amari we had a lot of people get in trouble on TikTok because get in trouble with with our regulatory people at the company, not get in trouble with the FTC because they went on like I did a um I did an interview with um one of the TV stations in Los Angeles. I was out in Los Angeles to do a to do a seminar about something. And um, I, I talked to one of the reporters out there about this new study that came out on saffron. And I, you know, I, I told him, I told him what I thought as a scientist. Yeah. Saffron can help with ADHD. It can help with depression, can do all these wonderful things. They interviewed another medical professional who basically corroborated what I was saying. And people took that little video clip and used it because in that clip, I was talking about the science so I could talk about the diseases, right? That's what this that's what the studies looked at. But then people who were selling the product took that clip and appended it to their product sale, and that's where they crossed the line, right? You can't do that kind of stuff, right? And that's and that can be confusing to people because they're like, well, why can't I? It's true. Why can't I talk about stuff that's true? It's because it crosses that it crosses that disease line, so to speak. Okay. So there's that one. Are there any questions about that, by the way, ADHD or anything like that? There's lots of ingredients that have been studied for ADHD, pine bark, theanine, um, saffron. Uh, what else would I throw in that category? Um, one of these other ones I'm going to talk about, where is it? Here's, here's, uh, here's, me here's Mentofocus. This has a pomegranate extract in it. This specific pomegranate extract, something the brand name is called, is called Palma. Yeah, that's right. P O M M A plus Palma plus. They grow it in California. They extract it in a really new, unique way, so it's different than other pomegranate extracts. It's been used in studies of Alzheimer's disease. Right? It doesn't cure Alzheimer's, but what it gets the people with Alzheimer's to to have is better function. What what are called activities of daily living. They're better at remembering. They're better at recognizing faces. They're better at you know, feeding themselves and, you know, clothing themselves and things like that. They're less likely to have sundowners where they get really confused in the, in the evening. So, you know, those are all, those are all wonderful benefits from a natural extract, pomegranate extract, but it's not all pomegranates. It's that one. So there's, there's one part of the sort of truthful and not misleading, but then you can't say Alzheimer's, right? You can't say, take pomegranate to help your Alzheimer's. You would have to say, take pomegranate to help support your memory take pomegranate to help improve brain function, to help, you guys get the idea, right? It's always that kind of wordplay, but knowing that you have to do the wordplay, you can do it in a very responsible way, okay? So there's that one. Um, let me see, I saw some things uh, pop up um, in, in the chat. Let me see if I need to answer any of these. Um, Here's a here's a good question. Does this mean we can refer to or quote something like an article 
in your textbook or, or a different article and put a link to where you got your information at the end of your post on social media. Yeah, you could like you could you could do that. I do I do that a lot when I like I'm not selling the products directly, right? I'm kind of I guess because I formulate a lot of these products that like I have a conflict of interest if I talk about a, you know an ingredient that's in a product that somebody might sell that might come back to benefit the company that I that I founded, you know, it could be could could be construed that way. But what I try to do is is like when I provide information like that, I'll say Here's the source material. Here's a link to the article that I'm talking about. I try to do that as much as possible. Most people don't click on that kind of stuff. Most people just want to know the, the headline. They don't necessarily want to know all the gory details. But by providing that, you're at least being responsible to say like, hey, I'm not just making this stuff up. I'm not just pulling it out of thin air. Here's 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 where it was here it was where, where it was where it was coming from. Um, the, the the last bottle that had the palma in it is uh, was was meant to focus. Okay. Um, which other one can I talk about here? Oh, here's a, here's a good juicy one for us to talk about. Um, so in these two products, these are two of my favorite ingredients, by the way, because they do so many good things. Um, so in Menta Sink, we have an ingredient called Wellmune is the brand of the ingredient. It's a yeast extract. In this product, GBX seed fiber, there's an ingredient called AHCC. It's a mushroom extract. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, not really a mushroom extract. It's an extract of the mycelium, which is the underground portion of the mushroom from a shiitake mushroom. So it's not the mushroom part of it. It's the underground sort of, sort of root structure. And so you can do an extract of that and you can do a, an extract of, of this yeast called Wellmune and they have profound anti-cancer benefits, right? So talk about something that would immediately get the FDA's radar you know, up in, you know, up in action, if you started making claims about treating cancer or preventing cancer, right? Absolutely not. Would you ever want to talk about that kind of stuff? And yet there are studies for AHCC in cancer and Wellmune in cancer, and they're out there. And I, I actually encourage pe people that will ask me questions. They'll say, you know, my family member is battling, you know, whatever form of cancer, what should they do? And I'll tell them, stop taking antioxidants, right? You don't want to take high dose antioxidants while you're under radiation therapy or chemotherapy because the antioxidants can actually protect the cancer cells at a greater degree than they're protecting your healthy cells. So while you're going through tr treatment, stop the antioxidants. When you're done with treatment, go back on them. But the things that you have to be supplementing with are a yeast extract, Wellmune, and a mushroom extract, mushroom mycelium extract, AHCC, because what they both can do in slightly different ways they prime your immune system so your immune system is better able to identify and fight cancer cells. Um, and so way back in the day, I want to say this must have been close to 20 years ago now, um, the company that makes Wellmune came, came to my research group and said, hey, we have this natural yeast extract that we're developing as a chemotherapy drug. Someday, we want to have a version of this Wellmune that you infuse in you know one arm while your chemotherapy is going in the other arm. The chemotherapy is killing the cancer and the, the Wellmune, a, a, a soluble version of it, is gonna help your immune system find and fight the cancer better. So you're coming at the cancer sort of from two perspectives. And their initial anti-cancer data showed that it could make the chemotherapy work about 20% better, right? And they said, it's a natural extract. We wanna sell it as a nutritional product to help people fight cancer. And I, I kind of laughed and I said, well, you'll, you're, you'll be dead in the water. The FTC will shut you down the day they hear about it. You can't do that. But these were all immunologists, right? They knew, they knew that it worked and they had the data, but they needed some help to figure out how can we put this on the market? So we, we did a bunch of studies for them to show it can prime your immune system so it can help you with upper respiratory tract infections, colds and flus and things like that. I'll come back to that in a second. It can help with allergies. It can help with gut health. It can help with a whole bunch of other things. So let's talk about that and not talk about cancer. So their, all their language was around take Wellmune. It will help your immune system be stronger. Take Wellmune. It will help protect your cells. Take Wellmune. It will help improve your well-being. That's how they came up with the name Wellmune, immune and, and wellness. Um, so, you know, it, it, it took a whole bunch of research to, to sort of go away from the good cancer research that they had, but that's, that's what it's doing. It's helping your immune system do its job better 
One part of the job is to protect you from viruses so you don't catch a cold. One part of it is to help your cells regenerate themselves and repair themselves. One part of it is, a, is cancer surveillance, right? So they got all of that and they're able to promote it in a different way. So in this product, Meant to Sync, it's in there to help your immune system. Um, in this product, Seed Fiber, uh, it doesn't do it. It's not a fiber. It was it was a it was an opportunity for me to put it into a product and give people a really good benefit uh, to help them with their with their overall immune system function. But those are those are great ingredients where we can't directly talk about what they do. So FTC would look at that and say, oh yeah, they can talk about cancer all day long because it's true. But FDA would look at it and say, we don't care if it's true or not. It's a disease. And so you know, again, another example about how the language has to be changed a little bit to get to get the point across in a in a responsible way in a legal way etc cetera, etc cetera. okay so let me um so AHC stands for active hexose correlated compound somebody's asking in the chat um, it's a, it j just refers to the structure of of what that of what that polysaccharide looks like it's a terrible name and the even the people who make it acknowledge that it's a terrible name um so so there um so I'm going to talk about autism in just a second, uh, Tracy. Uh, so I'll, I'll get to that. And let's see if there's anything else in here. Why not combine Wellmune and AHCC in one product? That's a great idea, actually. If if I ever had the opportunity to formulate like, uh, well, let me let me let me say this. If I were going to formulate a, a like a chemotherapy support product, um, I would absolutely do that. If I were going to formulate uh, an anti-COVID product. I would absolutely do that because you're helping your immune system in two slightly different ways to do the same thing, which is pay attention to viruses and cancer cells and things like that better. But the challenge is going to be, what the heck do you say about it, right? If you have a chemotherapy helpful product, doesn't matter how good it is, you can't market it for that, right? You, you, you just can't. And even if your customers start marketing it like that, right? Let's, let's say we took this approach. Let's say we put it out there. You know, we're, we're, you know, therapeutic ink, right? We all just set up a company together and we decided to put that product out there and it worked and we had really good data and it, it, we were seeing amazing results out there in the world. As soon as one of our customers went on their Facebook page and said, oh my gosh, I just finished my round of chemo and my doctor said I came through it with flying colors and I owe it all to the name of the product. As soon as they've done that, we're in trouble. Right. So th that's where FDA and FTC also cast a really, really wide net. So they will look at social media posts. That's why when Amari saw all the ADHD posts on TikTok for Kids Mood, our regulatory team had to scramble and run around and contact all of those people and say, You can't do this. Could you please take it down? You can't do that. Can you please take it down? Because that can get the, the person in trouble, but then it can get the company in trouble. Then it could potentially get the formulator in trouble. I've actually been through that. Like I had a run-in with the FTC 20 years ago where a product that I formulated, the marketers went out and said that it did things that I never approved and they got in trouble and I got in trouble and the people who were taking the calls got in trouble and the people who were shipping the product got in trouble because 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 that's that's how our industry works, right? So you have to be really careful with that kind of stuff. Um, so that's why I try to educate people as much as possible about about what you can do. Um, so let me see. There's a couple more questions in here, and then I'll go and then I'll go back to my show and tell. Um, so the HCC, um, Liz is asking regarding antioxidants. I understand reducing supplements, but what about foods that are high in antioxidants? Because there's so many benefits for the health and microbiome benefits. Yeah, um, it really, it really is a sort of doses. It, the dose is the poison kind of a kind of a scenario. Um, if you start supplementing with so so healthy high antioxidant foods are not going to be a problem. Um, but if you started supplementing with lots of beta carotene, lots of vitamin E, lots of vitamin C, can certain cancer cells can take up those nutrients at a higher level than your healthy cells do. So you're, you know, so you can think of it this way: you're protecting your healthy cells at this level by taking an antioxidant supplement, but you're protecting your cancer cells at this level, right? So they're getting more of a protective effect. And what ends up happening is. 
then your doctors have to use more and more radiation to kill the cells because you've just protected them or more and more chemo drugs to, to kill the cells. So we'll usually tell people, stop your supplements during chemo and radiation. And then afterwards, you can go back on your supplements to help with the, with the, with the repair process. Okay. So that's it. That's, that's a good question actually. Um, and yeah. And what about someone who's on the other side of cancer? What would you say would benefit them the most? Jazzy yeah. So sim similar thing, right? Go back on your supplements after that. Um, whether it's Wellmune or AHCC, or you go on your, you know, su su sunrise is a, is a nice way to get those antioxidants where they're not like isolated antioxidants at those high levels. Um, antioxidants are really like, I wrote a whole book about, about antioxidants a few years ago where taking a lot of antioxidants actually has a very well-known, at least well-known in biology, well-known um, scenario, which is, which is what we call an upside down U, like an inverted U, where too little antioxidants is bad. And then you get into this uh, uh, increasing, a little bit more is better, a little bit more is better, a little bit more is better until you reach sort of the sweet spot. And then when you start overdosing and you take more and more and more, it starts to cause more tissue damage. So you, instead of not protecting the cells enough, you're overprotecting them in a sense. And so that happens for, for all the antioxidants, happens for beta carotene, vitamin E, um, vitamin C, uh, lots of them. Um, and so there are ways, instead of just blasting people with antioxidants, you can take the approach of giving things like, like polyphenols, for example, flavonoids, to encourage the body to make its own antioxidants. And that doesn't have a have an inverted U-shaped curve because the body makes what it needs and then stops, and then makes what it needs and then stops. So there's way to there's ways to to kind of skin that antioxidant free radical cat without mega dosing on on uh, antioxidants. So um, and, 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 and that goes for, that goes for cancer therapy. It goes for, um, post-exercise recovery. It goes for, you know, protecting yourself from heart disease and, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff too. Okay. All right. So I get everything in the chat for now. Let me move, let me move to this other one. So I talked about lychee a little bit. Let me just, let me just close that loop. So in this product edge, three ingredients, mango leaf for sort of help wake up the brain, uh, palm fruit to help with gut health and signaling across the gut brain axis, dopamine production and things like that. And then lychee fruit. So some of the studies on this lychee fruit, this very specific oligonol have been done in people with diabetes. So when we talk about blood sugar control, this is a wonderful, wonderful way to do it. W why is that an, an important thing? Blood sugar control is important because if you're too high, that's going to put you towards pre-diabetes and diabetes. So you want to lower your blood sugar. But if you're too low, if you're, if you're prone to hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, a ligonol can work on either side of that. It's an example of what we call adaptogens, where it can take a high blood sugar back down to normal or a low blood sugar back up to normal. But some of those oligonol studies are done in patients with diabetes, showing that they had high diabetes. Now they have lower diabetes. Or they had high blood sugar. Now they have lower blood sugar, and that's in a in a in a good place. But taking high blood sugar down to low, that's an anti-diabetic effect that supplements can't have. The only thing that can have that is a drug, um, like an Ozempic or uh, you know any of the like a metformin, any of the anti-diabetes drugs that are out there. They're the only ones that are allowed to say lowers blood sugar. So we need to, even, even if it's true, even if there's data to show that, we can't say that because lowering blood sugar is an implied claim of treating diabetes, right? So we can't go there. So when we talk about blood sugar with a dietary supplement, we have to say maintains blood sugar levels already within a normal range. What the hell does that mean, right? That doesn't mean anything. That's nonsense. But that's the kind of stuff that we have to do. We have to do that with cholesterol too. Um, in this product, Mental Heart, we have an ingredient from from an orange, a little little orange. It, lo it looks like a lime actually, but it's but it's an orange. It's called bergamot. Bergamot lowers cholesterol, but we can't say lowers cholesterol. We have to say maintains cholesterol levels already within a normal range, right? That's what the FDA wants us to say, because if you have normal cholesterol levels or normal blood sugar levels, you don't have a disease, right? You're, you're, you're healthy. But the problem is, how, how in the world would you study that? 
how in the world would you design a clinical trial to prove maintains blood sugar in a normal range, maintains cholesterol in a normal range? You can't. So there are zero studies that show that. And that's where it gets really sticky, right? If the FDA ever came to me and said, show us the studies that show that this maintains normal blood sugar control, I couldn't, I couldn't show them anything. If they came and said, show me the studies that, that show that this, that this ingredient or this product maintains healthy cholesterol levels, I can't because my data set is people with high cholesterol coming down to lower or high blood sugar coming down to lower. You can't do a study that shows sameness, right? That's, that's a non-effect in a study. That would show that it doesn't work. You guys get, and you guys can kind of sense my frustration that this is this is the career I chose, right? So it's frustration every single day of my life when we're trying to talk about about these diseases. And and you know now that we're talking about mental wellness, anxiety and depression are another example of that. So let me let me shift gears a little bit. Here is this product, Mentibiotics. In here are three different strains of bacteria. Each one of them has been studied separately. One strain helps with stress. That's easy. And that's sort of our default position that we have to go to sometimes. I'll come back to that in just a second. One of them has been shown to help with anxiety. One of them has been shown to help with depression. So when I, when I look at the depression data, it's in, pre, it's in subjects. It's in, it's in people with, dep- with major depressive disorder, right? You can't get somebody who is happy and show that they're still happy right? There's like that, it, again, is a non-effect. So you have to have, you have to have what's called a delta. Delta is change. So you have to get somebody who has a problem. They're out of balance one way or another, and you have to do your intervention, and then you have to show a change, right? That's the, that's the delta. If you get people who are depressed, their mood is low, and then you can do your intervention, give them the, the strain, Lactobacillus helveticus 52, and you can show that it makes them less depressed, or it makes them more happy. And so there, that's your delta. But there's there's no place to change if you're trying to show maintenance. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. And so I'm in the same quandary where my data on the ingredient, on these probiotic strains was in depression, but I can't say depression. So I have to say mood, but there's no mood data. It's in people with that generalized anxiety disorder. And I show an anti-anxiety effect but it's hard for me to talk about anxiety because like I, like I started the call with, am I talking about anxiety, the mood state, or am I talking about anxiety, the disease, which is more accurately generalized anxiety disorder, right? So that's the, that's the dilemma we get into. It's same as the ADHD versus focus. It's the same as the, you know, the, the uh, cholesterol versus you guys get the idea. It makes it really, really frustrating. Um, in, also in this product are two prebiotic fibers that have been studied in different studies. One of the studies was done in England. One of the studies was done in Japan. Um, looking at these prebiotic fibers in kids with autism spectrum disorder, right? So autistic kids given a fiber and because they got the fiber, they saw a change in their microbiome. Because they saw a change in their microbiome, they saw a change in the, in the, in the, in the bioactives, the molecules that were being produced, neurotransmitters and short chain fatty acids and those sorts of things. As a result of that, they, they had less inflammation, they, they behaved better, right? They had better communication, they had better eye contact, they had less irritability, um, they had less um, you know, anxiety, anxious, anxious behaviors. They, they behaved better because of, because of the fiber that they got. But I can't say that this product, because it has those fibers, helps with autism, right? The best I can say is that it helps with overall well-being. It helps improve, you know, day-to-day functions. It, you know, it, so that's the that's the landscape that we're in. What what else do I have for for examples here? Mood Mood Plus, another good example. Um, a couple of really good ingredients in here. The ashwagandha we use is ashwagandha is one of the hottest of all the herbs out on the market right now. We use a really specific ashwagandha in here called Sensoril. Sensoril has been, been studied in anxiety disorders. It's been studied in people with just generalized everyday stress. And I said I was going to come back to that. So let me talk about this now. One of the reasons that we study as many stressed people as we do is because stress isn't a disease. Um, we can get people who are moderately stressed, but not depressed. 
We can get people who are moderately depressed, but don't have anxiety disorders. We can get people who are moderately stressed, but don't have ADHD. Um, and in those people, we can use mood state surveys to show, yes, their depression goes down, but that's a mood state, right? We can show that your depression is a 14 to begin with, and now your depression is a 10. That's enough of a delta, right? Enough of a change where I can say your mood is improved. And the, the actual measurement is that your depression index came down 42% or whatever that number would be, but it's not, it's not treating depression. It's, a, it's called depression as a mood state, but you're not treating major depressive disorder. Same thing for anxiety indexes. So that's why that, that's one of the reasons that we use stressed out people a lot. It gives us that middle ground between somebody who is still healthy, which is what FDA wants us to look at and not diseased. And it gives us data to be able to, so we satisfy FDA, but then it gives us data where we can say, look, it's truthful and not misleading. It's an actual effect and that satisfies FTC, right? So we always have to kind of be in that, in that navigation line, right? Right between the two, the two pillars, so to speak. And it, it can be challenging sometimes, and it can be really easy to stray over into one side or the other. And that's why, that's why we have a regulatory team. That's why they're always talking to people and saying, Hey, you know, you stepped over the line a little bit, you know, could you, could you pull it back, you know, just so we're, so our toes are just on this side of the line. It may, it makes it safer for everybody. Okay. And I saw, as I was describing that, I saw a bunch of people uh, put put comments in. So let me go let me go up here and look, and then I'm going to talk about one more thing. I'm going to continue talking about Mood Plus. Um, uh, lowering blood sugar. If you don't, oh, so so here so here's a, here's how drug companies get around certain things too. Um, Tracy's asking th 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 this is a good question, Tracy. Um, I was just doing research on lowering blood sugar and was ready to post about it. If I don't attach it to a product. Can I say that when when not talking a product, but only talking about a specific herb? It's kind of a gray area. Um, so I'm talking very freely in this forum right now because we're we're talking to certified mental wellness coaches. We're talking in a closed environment um, on Canvas at Marietta College. So I have a little more leeway to to talk about diseases and like really tell people like, Hey, it's true, and but you can't talk about it, like that kind of thing. The danger, if I were to take this video and post it up on YouTube, the danger would be, not that I can't say what I'm saying, but that somebody would take it and, and not listen to my recommendations and they would go, oh, saffron, ADHD, and off to TikTok. Or they would, or they would say, oh, well-mune cancer, and, and off to Instagram, right? So that's the danger with trying to be, you know, open book about, about the whole thing. Um, but but what Tracy just asked about is kind of a gray area because, you know, you could you could say, all right, I'm posting about lowering blood sugar over here and this study. And then over here, I'm talking about selling a product that has the same ingredient that I talked about over here. It's kind of a gray area of how close are you doing it? Um, so, you know, risk is on a scale of one to 10. I, I, you know, I, is it is it is, is it a five? Is it a four? Is it a nine? That's you know that's where you have to kind of decide what what level of of tolerance that you wanna you wanna do. Um, so let me see what else is up here. Uh, can you say something like X strain of bacteria has been shown to do Y? Yeah, you can you can do that. But 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 same thing, right? So when I talk about these bacteria and I say I look at the label and I go, yes, Lactobacillus Helveticus R zero zero fifty two. We know that that one raises serotonin. We know that it lowers neuroinflammation. We know that it helps people with depression be less depressed, right? Well, what do I do with that now that I want to sell it, right? I can't say that if I want to sell it, but that data is, exists out there. Then I have to say Lactobacillus Helveticus R0052 helps people improve their mood, right? Well, so that's that's what we have to do, even if it's not perfectly aligned with what the data says. Okay. Um, in, in a trial that we did on our, our original pack at Amari, it was called Fundamentals. We used um, we used a technique called Profile of Mood States to measure how people were feeling, right? It's uh, POMS is the, is the acronym, Profile of Mood States Survey. It's six, 64, 65 questions. People ask about how they've been feeling. You can score it and you can see how people change over time. One of those scales 
is called depression. One of those scales is called anxiety. And so when we published the data, we published it and said, you know, the people had a 42% reduction in depression, 52% reduction in anxiety, whatever the numbers were. Um, and sometimes people get, get scared about that data because it says depression, anxiety. But remember what I said at the very beginning, those are mood states in, in normal, healthy people. The people in that trial were not depressed. They, were, they didn't have major depressive disorder. They didn't have generalized anxiety disorder. They didn't have any disease state. They were specifically recruited to be moderately stressed, healthy people. So if there's no disease, how can you show a treatment of a disease if it wasn't there in the first place, right? So that's the first part of it. The second part of it, is um that the profile of mood states is a non-diagnostic tool. So it's not used to diagnose people with depression or diagnose people with anxiety. So it can't be used in that context anyway. Um, one of the ingredients that we have in this product, Mood Plus, um, which ingredient would it be? It's called Refuma. We use a brand called Venetron is the brand name of this Refuma. In traditional Chinese medicine, it's been used to, to help with you know what thousands of years ago they would call melancholy, where people are just they don't feel very good, right? They're depressed, but they didn't they didn't know what depression was back thousands of years ago. So they give them this flower, they would feel better. And now we know that they feel better because their serotonin levels are higher and their brain is working better. And so that ingredient, Rafuma, specifically the Venetron brand, has been used in studies of people with major depressive disorder to show if they take it over 30 days, their depression index goes down about 30%. After, after 60 days, two months, their depression index is down 50%. In that trial, they use something called the Hamilton Depression Index, right? It's depressed people. They're using a diagnostic tool that is used to diagnose depression, and they show that it reduces by 30% and 50% over those over one month, two months, right? So that's the data we have. How do we use that herb in a product that can't be used, that can't be marketed to treat depression, can't be marketed to treat anxiety? We just say that it improves mood, right? Does that make sense to everybody? And 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 you do that for the anxiety ingredient, you do that for the stress ingredient, you do that, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to do that across the board for all the products. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and then we'll wrap it up. Let me see what time. Oh, it's already it's already after two. Okay, I really enjoy talking about this this topic. It's 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 important, and it's um it's something I wrestle with every single day. So it's something that I'm um I I, I try to be as up on as possible. The last piece that confuses people, and I and I forgot to grab one of them. I don't know if I have one. Aha, I have one sitting over there. Bear with me a second. Okay, so here's here's our, our uh, hemp product. Um, so hemp products or CBD products, right before COVID, they were the biggest thing in the supplement industry. Um, it, it, you know, CBD products, uh, hemp stock extracts, um, they help with anxiety, they help with sleep quality, they help with mood, they help with stress, they help with pain. They do a lot of really, really good things if they're good quality extracts. So we formulated a product, came out with it. Um, the, the reason that, that products like this, um, they have a weird regulatory status right now. FDA considers any CBD product to be a drug. So it's not that FDA, and, and so they, they, the reason they consider it to be a drug is because there is a drug on the market that is a very purified CBD. Um, I can't think of the name of, uh, Epidolex or something like that. It's called. It's used to treat um, epilepsy. It's used to treat seizures. Um, it's 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 a hundred times more powerful than what we have here in terms of its total CBD content. Um, so the FDA's perspective isn't that it can't be used to treat disease. It can be used to treat that very specific disease of of epilepsy. And so because it's a drug, FDA's perspective is that it cannot also be a supplement, right? You have to live in one world or the other, and you can't be in both. And even though hemp has been around since the beginning of time, um, this drug is an approved drug, and so that supersedes everything in FDA's, in FDA's view. So there can, from, from an FDA perspective, there can never ever be a legal dietary supplement that contains CBD, because that would be considered an unapproved drug. Um, so technically 
this is an unapproved drug. It's kind of a gray area right now because um, there's some laws pending in different states that might allow CBD to be more of a, of a mainstream dietary supplement so it could live in both worlds. Um, I, I, don't have, I don't have a lot of hope for that happening. And I'll tell you why. Um, I was involved with a company more than 20 years ago. Oh, but yeah, more than 20 years ago, where we had a product that had a, an ingredient called red yeast rice in it. Um, it's, a, it's a red yeast that grows on rice. It's a traditional Chinese medicine therapy for lowering cholesterol, and it works like crazy. It lowers cholesterol almost as good as any of the cholesterol drugs, the statins that are on the market. And the reason for it is that it naturally has a, a compound in it called a monocolon that is structurally similar to what a statin is. So it's been there since the beginning of time, naturally occurring. And FDA's perspective on that was you can't sell that even though it's natural because that chemical structure is now an approved drug in all these statin medications that are out there. So we fought them and fought them and fought them. We spent millions of dollars in litigation fees. And finally, we realized you can't fight City Hall. We're never going to win this. And we had to take it off the market. Um, and that was terrible because it really, really worked. It really helped a lot of people in a natural way without the side effects that you get from statins. And now it, and now it's gone. Um, and I, I hate to think that the same thing is going to happen here, but I have the history of going through that. And, I, and, I, and, I, and it, just, it just breaks my heart because we actually just got a patent on this formula, right? So the US Patent and Trademark Office says, great idea. We're going to give you a patent to protect that invention for the next 20 years because it does all these wonderful things. And we're just going to throw it in the bottom of a desk drawer now because it doesn't matter because we we'll probably can't sell this product for very much longer if the FDA doesn't come around. So like, it's just, ah, it's frustrating you guys. Um, I think that's all, that's all my, my show and tell. The other one I was going to show is, is relief um, uh, to, to, to make the point that um, this has ingredients turmeric, boswellia, scutellaria, that have all been shown to help lower inflammation, which we can't say, and lower the pain of arthritis that we can't say, right? So that's what the data shows. But inflammation, you can, j just like with cholesterol, just like with blood sugar, if you have a high level of it, the FDA views that as, as a disease. And so if you're coming from a high level back down to a normal level, you just treat it as a disease. With inflammation, the only way we can say it is that we, we maintain healthy levels of inflammation already within a normal range, right? And then there's all these, all these arthritis studies that show that your pain goes down. So we did a study a couple of years ago to try to get around this, uh, where we got people who were healthy, active people. And how do you get pain in somebody who doesn't have a problem? You put them through a CrossFit style workout. And so that's what we did. We got two trainers and we said, hey, could you design a program for us that makes people really, really sore? It has to be like a 30 to 45 minute workout. And the people have to be basically debilitated the next day. And these two trainers, they're, they're evil people. They were just like, yes, that would be great. We, could, we would love to do that kind of a workout. So people came in, they did the workout. The next two days, they were really, really sore. And we, we did range of motion measurements in all of them. So we had one group on the supplement. We had one group on the placebo. And you could tell right away who was on the placebo because they could barely move their bodies. And the people who were on the supplement, they were, still, they were still sore, but at least they were able to function. And we measured range of motion and we measured pain levels. And you know we, had, we, we were able to like touch their muscles and say, is that a, on a scale of one to 10 visual analog score? Is that a one or is it a 10 or is it a seven? And we tracked them over a course of a week because what we wanted to see is when did their pain peak? When did it go away? When was it intolerable? When was it toler tolerable? And so the, like the, you know, the sort of genius of doing it that way is no one, no one, you know, we, we, we have the data so we can sh say it's true. F FTC likes that. But we also have data that's not in a disease state. We can say these were healthy people without arthritis and it reduced their pain, but it's muscular pain. It's post-exercise pain. It's soft tissue pain. We can talk about things that aren't joint problems, which is the disease state, right? So like it's all those hoops that you have to jump through being a, being a formulator, 
being a, a, a product marketer, being somebody who's building a, a business around, you know, some of you as, as coaches are using products, some of you are not. But so if you're using products, if you're using supplements in your practice, you have to understand that there's ways you can talk about it and be really passionate and really, you know, excited about talking about them this way, but don't st step over the line. Okay. It's going it, to, it's, your, your customers and your clients are still going to get the same benefits, but it's going to keep you out of trouble. It's going to keep the company out of trouble. It's going to, it's going to make it good for everybody. So I know we want to a little bit over time. Um, but if, if there's any questions that people want to like raise your hand and, and ask, I think I got through most of the things in the, um, in the, in the chat, but if people want to ask questions, I'd be happy to, happy to answer them. Just raise your hand and then we can, we can unmute you. And if there's not, oh, Tra Tracy, I can see you raising your hand. Go ahead. Okay, I put in the chat. So a few years ago in Women's Day magazine, there was an article published where this woman had found mentobiotics online and taken it for her thyroid issue. And in that article, she says that it helped her heal her thyroid. So I have that article and she, so do I just file that away? I mean, no, well, that's a, that's a great example, right? So, so the company would, wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole, right? Heal your thyroid. That's a disease treatment. Um, you know, uh, uh, I got off my thyroid medication. That's a, that would also be considered a disease treatment. Um, comparing something to a drug disease treatment. Um, so the company didn't say it, you didn't say it. Here it is. Here it is in this magazine. It's gray area, right? If like a stringent FDA regulator would say, no, don't use that. Burn it because it shouldn't have been published in the first place. But it, I, I don't know. So depends on how you use it. It's true, right? You didn't make it up. It was put there in the magazine. So you're, you're just providing information. So if a person has their own personal experience, like we do have a testimonial page where you can go on and hear people's testimonials, right? Yep. And so if you have your own personal, I've heard that if it's your own personal testimony, you that's can a, see it. That's a great point, actually. So, so here's here's where there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a, a of a loophole. When it comes to testimonials, if it's your true story, you can talk about it all day long. That's the First Amendment piece, right? Where you can say, "This is what happened. This is what I did." This is what product I use. This is what regimen I followed. This is what ingredient I ingested, whatever. And these are the benefits that I got. And in that situation, sure, you can talk about your disease. You can talk about your your transformation. You can talk about your 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 bio numbers. You can you can do whatever you want to talking about your situation. The prob where you need to stop is then stepping over the line of saying, and you can too. Right. So you can say, I did this and I got these benefits. Awesome. As soon as you imply directly or indirectly that that person can get the same benefits that you did, that's when you've crossed over the line. That would be the F so FDA wouldn't like it if you were talking about diseases. FTC wouldn't like about it because there's no way that you can tell them that it's truthful that they will get those benefits that, that you got. Right. So what you have to do then is just say, so I got these great benefits from from X. Um, if you're interested, you could see what it does for you. Like that would be the way to do it. Okay. And and in that situation, they may or may not get similar benefits. But you haven't promised anything. Okay. Jazzy has an off-topic question about electros. How many of those can you take in a day? Are you are you you're you're trying to stay hydrated? I see, Jazzy. That's that's a good thing. And this all this heat that's going around the country. So electro, the the only one thing that could be a problem, you can you can drink lots of them. Um, it has 150 milligrams of sodium per per little sachet, and so sodium's the only thing that you would maybe have a problem with, like getting up to you know high sodium intake. Um, I, I take two almost every day because I put it in my water bottles. Um, so I wouldn't think that, that would be a problem, but I wouldn't go I wouldn't go much above that. Okay, because you're getting sodium and other stuff in your in your diet too. Okay. Um, let me see. Did I get this right? Rafuma depression improved 50% over 60 days. Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah, and I and I um, 
Yes, that's right. And so, you know, w- w- with a product like this, with Mood Plus, you know, there's, it's, when we talk about mental wellness, I had a, had a really good phone call this morning with a, a, another researcher that does brain scans. And we were talking about how we're going to try to use brain scans to, tr- in some of the research we have planned for early next year, um, to try to segment all these different mood states. Like one of the challenges we have right now when we talk about mental wellness is that sometimes people don't feel good because they their mood is not good, right? They're, they're higher on the depression index. Sometimes it's because their anxiety is too much. Sometimes it's because of stress. Sometimes it's because of brain fog. Sometimes it's because of fatigue. Sometimes it's be- because of um, uh, ADHD, which is different than brain fog, right? Those are all different, but you don't necessarily know which one of those someone is feeling or experiencing and they just feel crummy. And so what we're going to try to do is, is do take some of the microbiome stuff that I do and some of the brain scan stuff that he does to try to figure out, could we segment these people and say, aha, you need an ADHD style treatment and you need a brain, uh, brain fog memory kind of treatment, or you need an de- anti-depression treatment and you need an anti-anxiety treatment, or you need a f- daytime f- a fatigue ch- treatment and you need a nighttime relaxation sleep quality treatment, right? We think we can do that. It's going to be a long time before we actually will be able to sort of roll it out to the average public. But to actually have a, a like a quantitation of your mood issue is this and your mood issue is that, that would that would completely change the game around around mental wellness. So we yeah, we two of us geeked out for about two hours this morning about what what measurements we could do and what how we would design our studies and stuff like that. So that'll be something maybe we'll start talking about um in the next couple of months once we get the studies off the ground. So anyway, I'm going to stop it there. It's about a half hour over time. I uh, really appreciate you guys jumping on. Uh, and this will be, be posted up so you guys can watch it later um, if, if you want to. Okay, see you next time, guys. Bye-bye.